Saxon Algebra 1, Lesson 113. Um, number one, let me say to you, this is the penultimate week of our year. We have this week of new lessons and we have next week of new lessons. So we are very near the end. The word penultimate means the one before the last, which you will know if you have read the series of unfortunate events books. The Netflix series is sublime. That's more your generation. But the books that came out, uh, what? Early 2000s. Read them, you guys. They're the best. Um, so penultimate is a word that Lemony Snicket added to our vocabulary from back in the day. So now you know, um, if you didn't before, because you may have very well known before. Lesson, so lesson 113 is where we're at. This is a lesson that we will come back to next year and develop in more detail. Oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that I'm outside today, as you can see from our table. It's a different table. I'm out in my backyard. Um, the sounds of nature may encroach upon us. I heard some crows screaming a few minutes ago. So just enjoy that. Math in the garden, what could be more poetic? Um, so there are two kinds of variation that we are going to study. The first one is called direct variation. That's a good name to me. Um, I like things that are direct. Um, what I want you to imagine is a room full of low shelves with a billion toys on it. Toys for little kids, right? Um, they're on low shelves. They go all the way around the four sides of the room. They're all neatly arranged and everything's put away and it looks really good. Um, the room is very comfortable. Carpeting, not much else. Um, no moms around just toys. Now we're going to start letting kids into that room one at a time and just invite them to play. Now imagine it in your mind's eye for every child that comes in the room. The first one comes in. Does he just take one toy down from the shelf and play with it? No, you guys, these are two year olds. They play with one for a hot second. Then they go back and get another. Then they carry three more off just because they can. For every child that enters that room, they're gonna do the very same thing. So as the number of toddlers in the room increases, the number of toys on the floor is gonna go up by way more. It's gonna be proportional because let's say that on average, every child takes down 10 toys in the first 15 minutes. Um, there will be a relationship between these two numbers, but the rate of toys on the floor, the number of toys on the floor is going to go up way faster than the number of toddlers because each toddler can put some of your toys on the floor. Um, this is what we mean by direct variation. The two things are moving in the same direction. Now the toddlers all get tired. They go off to a different room to have juice and crackers and their moms come in the room. And as the, mm, no, that's not going to work. That works for my next example. So never mind that. Uh, variations can also work down. As one thing decreases, let's say the toddlers start falling asleep on the floor. As the number of toddlers sleeping, the number of toddlers playing comes down, then the number of toys that are being taken out now is also going to decrease. So it can, it can be an up variation or a down variation. The way that we write this is that the number of toys, sorry, I wrote the wrong thing. The number of toys on the floor equals the number of toddlers times a special number that we call K. And that is a constant, a number that stays the same with all groups of toddlers that let you calculate how many toys are on the floor. I just said that every toddler takes down, what did I say? Let me make up a new number. They take down 10 toys in the first 15 minutes. So this would be 10, right? In our example that I just made up, because every toddler is good for 10 toys. So if six toddlers came in the room, you would have 60 toys on the floor, all right? The way we globalize this pattern is like this. Condition A is equal to condition B times a constant. So this is what we're going to use for our 
uh, kind of our base equation, and then we'll make each story fit to that model. Ready? Now, a lot of students will listen to my example about the toys and the toddlers and go, yeah, okay, that sounds fine. I get it. I get the basic idea. Then when I lapse into the first problem, it always makes everybody's hair stand on end because I go from a familiar and friendly feeling situation into science. And that always makes everybody a, l a little bit nervous. But let me show you how easily we can translate a simple idea to a situation that sounds difficult. I'm going to read one sentence. The mass of a substance varies directly as the volume of the substance. Ah, oh, dang it. We sit here and we start going, what's mass? What's value? volume? What is this substance? How are those two things related? Guess what, you guys? It doesn't matter. You don't have to know about the science of this. You don't have to think about the science of this to make the math work. So I'm going to show you how my brain focuses on the math and just doesn't even bother with the science. Ready? I'm going to read it again. The mass of a substance varies directly as the volume of the substance. Okay, so what I get is math equals constant times the volume. Okay, I don't really know in my head what mass is or volume. I mean, I do, but I just don't worry about that. I just put this equation in the order of the sentence. The mass of a substance varies directly, so I know this is what's going to work, as the volume. If the mass of two, liter, of two liters is 10 kilograms, what will be the volume of 35 kilograms? Again, we're getting a bunch of numbers. Our heads are starting to spin. Okay, let me remind you, these are always two-step problems. In the first step, we solve for K. In the second step, we use K to solve a different scenario. Okay, so we're always going to get one set of information that will allow us to solve for K, and then we'll use that in its last part. So if a mass of two liters, okay, two liters, I know two liter pop bottles, that tells me that's a volume. Okay, so if the mass of two liters is 10 kilograms, okay, that tells me that M equals 10 kilograms, I recognize that as a weight because grams are a way to weigh things because whenever there's um, movies about drug people, you know, they weigh their drugs out in grams. Um, and so the two liters, I know that's a volume because of the pop bottles, right? Sparkling rain, whatever. Um, okay, so I'm putting these units here not because I need them, but because it helps me remember Mass goes with grams, volume goes with liters. That makes sense to me. Okay, so this is scenario one, and then we're also supposed to figure out what would be the volume, so that's what we don't know, if the mass is 35. Oh, this was kilograms, I'll put it in there. 35 kilograms, okay? So we use this part and this equation to solve for K. Ready, so we know that. I'm gonna work up here a little bit so I don't run out of space. Um, 10. I'm plugging into this now. I'm not using buckets because everything's positive. Two, no, K is what we don't know, and the volume is two. Okay, so 10 is the mass, volume is two. I plug them into my equation. My equation I pulled right from the sentence. I didn't even stress about what order the words were in. I just copied it down the same way the sentence said it. And now I can solve, I'm getting key, K, K by itself. I'm kept trying to say key. Divide both sides by two, and we get K equals five. Okay? Don't hurt your brain trying to figure out what that number means other than in the science context. All you need to know is that five is the magical number in this equation that links these two variables. Okay, so now we can use this and this to set the equation up again. Note there are three parts, and in each case we have two. So this time we want to know the volume, and we know that 35 equals 5 times the volume. 
So we divide both sides by five. The algebra is super easy, right? And we get that the volume equals seven. I flipped them around. Seven, what does seven mean? This constant doesn't have a unit. It's just a thing, a mathematical construct. Our volume we know is liters, so I'm gonna write liters here. And that's the right answer. It's not that hard, right? Once you understand how to take the sentence and put it into this format, then it's just this two-step business, which we've run into before and we'll run into many times again. We solve for something that's missing and then go ahead. All right, there are two more problems Ugh, in this part, and then we have to do the inverse variations. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm working you to death. I'm working myself to death. Ready, let's flip. I hope the light's okay out here for you. Okay, I'm gonna write this again. A equals K times B. A and B fit the scenario. K, K always represents the constant. Example 113.2. The distance traversed by a car traveling at a constant speed, okay, that's just to make life easy for us, is directly proportional to the time spent traveling. Distance equals the constant times the time. Okay, that makes sense. The, the constant would be the speed, right? Okay, if the car goes 75 kilometers in one, no, oh, in five hours, sorry, I lied. How far will it go in seven hours? Okay, so we recognize, well, that's the distance. This is the time. Then we get the time again, so we must be supposed to be finding the distance, right? Okay, step one, we use this information to solve for K. That's a five. That's really hard to read. It looks like a six. Okay, so 75 equals K times five. Algebra is easy. And that is 15. K equals 15. Again, there's no unit on that. That's just the number that describes the relationship between these other two things. Now, we're solving for the distance. It equals 15 times seven. Right, so we can take that constant and apply it to our new scenario. And we get, let's see, seven times 10 is 70 plus 35. That would be 105 kilometers equals D. I'll put it again there, right? Yay, we got that one right. See, these are fast and easy once you get the, once you get the drill. And they're delightfully uncomplicated. There aren't a bunch of radical signs or exponents or crazy business like that. It's just straightforward. Under certain conditions, uh-oh, here comes a sciency one, so just buckle in. Under certain conditions, the pressure of a gas varies directly as the temperature. All right, so I just write it the very same way using the sentence. The pressure of a gas varies directly as the temperature. Don't worry about trying to make a meaning of the sentence to find the relationship. Just copy the sentence down in equation format don't think about it too much. Like I sit there going, well now which would be the first? Uh, no, don't do that. Just put the letters in the same order that you hear them, that you hear the words in the sentence. When the pressure is 800 pascals, okay, I don't know what a pascal is. It's something that measures pressure, but I'm just gonna write it down. The temperature is 400 kelvins. Okay, I know that one. What is the temperature when the pressure is 400 pascals. If you can use those units to help give you a hint, I'm gonna write this out so we don't confuse it with our constant. Um, if they help you, that's great. If they don't help you, that's fine, just ignore them. All right, don't let them stress you. Okay, um, so now we're gonna solve for K. We're gonna say 800 equals K times 400 we're gonna divide by 400. Oh, I love it when the numbers come out easy. K equals two, yeah? I usually undersquiggle those because that helps me find that number again when I need it, which I'm gonna need right now. Um, now, temperature is what we don't have, so 400 equals two times T. Divide both sides by two, and we get that the new temperature will be 200 Kelvins, I'll write it out again so I don't get confused. 
K is, for some reason, just the traditional letter that we mathematicians use for our constants in these problems. Um, but K is also the abbreviation for Kelvin, so that's confusing. That's right. Okay. Inverse variation is what happens when you put the dads, when you put a group of dads in a room with a bunch of pizza. The more... Let me just write this down. Inverse variations. The more dads that come in the room, each one is going to eat, mm, what do you think, you guys? Five slices of pizza? Depends on the dads, I suppose. Let's make it teenage boys, because we can count on them more reliably to eat pizza. The more teenage boys that come into the room, the less pizza you're going to have because each teenage boy is going to be good for five slices in the first 15 minutes. Let's say they've been hiking. Um, so this is the teenager, teenage boys. Girls can eat that much. Sometimes they do, but you know, sometimes girls don't want to eat that much in front of other people or maybe they just ate a whole bag of Starburst jelly beans. You never know. Um, Okay, so this is what we call an inverse variation. As the number of boys goes up, the, number, the amount of pizza is going to drop much faster because each boy is eating, in our case, five slices. So that means their constant is K, right? Well, the, we have another little... Um, so the amount of pizza left equals some constant divided by the number of boys. Okay, it's different for an inverse variation. And don't, don't worry yourself trying to figure out why, just accept this. Later we'll talk about why it is, but um, when we want to create this inverse relationship, we divide. Here's our direct relationship, but our inverse relationship looks like this. Okay, so that's the model we're going to use for these problems. And the problem tells us whether it's a direct variation or an inverse. I don't know if you noticed that, but in the um, problems that I read, it, it had the expression varies directly. Those are the words. It's very straightforward what um, John's trying to tell us. There's no mystery to that. Okay, flipping, checking. Now we have two more of these problems. Ready? a long lesson you guys you're getting more advanced because the lessons are getting more complicated okay ready under certain conditions again we have to deal with the dumb science aspect of it but again don't let that bother you under certain conditions the pressure of a perfect gas pressure varies inversely thank you this with volume the pressure varies inversely with the volume. Okay, that's all you have to do. Same two steps. We solve them exactly the same way. We just have a different, slightly different equation. When the pressure equals 7 vat pascals, the volume equals 75 liters. Grace? Grace is climbing in the flowers. Out! Out, you crazy lady. Come on. Come on. She's in the middle of all my flowers. Hang on, I gotta get her out. This is not okay. Grace, come on. Come, child. <sighs> ah! Oh, you beast. Come on. Good girl. Whew, tragedy averted, but really a little bit of a problem there. She crushed some things. Okay, where was I? When the pressure of a quantity of gas is seven pascals, Pascals doesn't help me, so I don't even bother writing it down. Um, the volume is 75 liters. Okay, that helps me because I know what a liter is. What would be the volume if the pressure is increased to 15 Pascals? All right, here we go. Pressure, 7 equals K over 75. So now we multiply, right? We cross multiply. This is over 1, so it doesn't hurt anything. So... K equals 75 times 7, 35, 49, 52. Remember, there's no unit on that. It's just a number that links pressure to volume. 
And now, so that's step one. And then step two is solving for this. And we go when 15 equals 525 over V, right? Yes, there's our version of it. That's everything filled in. Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, think of it again as cross multiplying and we're going to get 15V equals 525 and then we're gonna divide both sides by 15 and we're gonna go 525. Yes, I want you to do it by hand. 15 into 52 goes three times, so that's 45. Right, and then we get 75. Oh, look at that, it's gonna come out even, isn't it? Um, and we just figured out, no, I guess we didn't. Um, 15, okay, I'm adding by 15s. 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, so it's five times. And let's just check it, 25, two, yes. Okay, so the volume will be 35 liters. That's the right answer. Yay. So even when the numbers are a little bit harder, they're not hard. Later, we're going to learn, next year, we're going to learn how to do these with scientific notation. Ooh, that's an exciting day. Last one. To travel a fixed distance, rate is inversely proportional to the time required. Okay, rate is inversely proportional to time. When the rate is 60, kilometers per hour. The time required is four hours. What would, would, what would be the time required for the same distance if the rate were increased? So what would be the time if the rate were increased to 80 kph? Okay. Same thing as always, don't let the words in the problem scare you, just pull the equation and the numbers and plug them in. So in the first part, we see 60 equals K over four. K equals, we cross multiply, that's over a one. 240, no units on that, it's just a number. And now we solve, again we use this, 80 equals, 240 over T. That's what we're trying to find. Now, here's a thing that you can use as a shortcut. Back here, we found that when we cross multiplied these, um, no, that's not where I wanna see it. I wanna see it here. Here we cross multiplied. We saw that we ended up with 525 times this, right? That's what we got here. And then we divided both sides by the 15. What we ended up doing basically is the 15 and the V changed places, which makes sense because they're in the same part of the cross multiplying, so that's cool. What we can do as a shortcut to the algebra is we can just let these guys trade places. And so we can say T equals 240 over 80. I'm just cutting out a step or two by rewriting it directly from here to here. Um, but once you understand how cross multiplying works, you'll see that that's perfectly logical. Perfectly logical. We can do that and we get that T equals three hours. And that's correct. Okay, these problems are easy, they're fun, they're important, not only because we're gonna see them next year and build on them, but also because they crop up in science quite often. So this may be something that will help you when you get to physics and chemistry. Um, so it's super applicable and they're not very hard. Can you hear me say that? I whispered, they're not very hard. So once you get past the kind of shock value of some of these weird scenarios, they're easy. Okay, I'm done, bye.